welcome to Wedge Island. I'm Ollie Dunn and I will be your tour guide for the day. Let's take a look. As part of my PhD, I travelled to the island to study two seabird species, short-tailed shearwaters and little penguins. And this is my home from home. Good morning and welcome to my humble home. Today we're going to be having a look at the life of a marine ecologist in the field. And it begins every day for the past month, waking up in this lovely little tent. I live on Wedge Island for between two and five weeks at a time, along with my volunteers who come to help. And I wouldn't be able to do my work without them. Hiya. Our campsite includes our gazebo, where we eat and work, our hut for equipment, our washing up station, the rubbish and recycling corner, and then you may be wondering where the bathroom is. Well, you're actually looking at it as the ocean doubles up as our toilet and shower. And it's safe to say that most people aren't envious of that bit of field work. Each morning begins with getting the campsite ready for the day. And you may notice how gloriously beautiful the weather is, but it's not always like that on Wedge. And battling the wind is not an uncommon way to start a day. Like the time I woke up to see the gazebo almost flying away to Oz. And it gets very wet on the island as well sometimes, but usually this is followed by a pot of gold rainbow. But today we have blue skies, you end up feeling quite relaxed when you're on the island because everything takes longer than normal. Even just boiling some water for a cup of coffee takes a long time because you usually have to refuel the stove. Because the island is completely uninhabited from people except for us, we have to bring all of our supplies with us, either at the start of a trip or on volunteer changeover days. This is me packing the food for a month long trip and doing my best to resist the urge to start eating all of the snacks. And planning the food is probably the hardest part of the job, as you don't really know what your co-workers are going to enjoy eating. And a good tip for being a scientist that works out in the field is to be as non-fussy with food as possible, as you often have to get quite inventive with your meals, as the weeks tick by and you have fewer ingredients to work with, and you do your best to make the same meals that you eat every day more and more interesting. Welcome to Dove's Cooking. Today for breakfast, we are serving you up some porridge with some almonds and some other nuts and all the sultanas that Noemi didn't want to eat. And we've also got, what have we got in there? Some random vegan Nutella that was left over and solidified, but we've also got some hot chocolate powder and it may look a little bit like gruel, but it actually tastes better than it looks. Mmm, no, it's actually okay. As important as taking enough food is taking enough water. There's no drinking water available on the island. So each morning, I usually refill the jerry cans we use for cooking and drinking, as well as do a water count to make sure we're still on track to have enough water before the next supply drop. And as with no drinking water, there's no showers or baths. So hygiene is as minimum as you'd expect, with occasional dips in the salty sea being the closest we can to being clean. I personally like to plait my hair back because I find it reduces the number of twigs that end up in there. And then after breakfast comes data entry and studying like how these guys are doing right now. Look at these hard biologists at work. <laughs> Later on in the morning, and there's usually odd jobs to do around the island, such as hiking up to the peak to download data from my weather station. And this weather station can record wind, rain, sun, pressure, and environmental variables as these are just one part of the jigsaw behind studying animal behavior. And we're back to eating. You may be thinking that all we seem to do is eat, and you're probably correct. It's not easy being a field zoologist, and keeping up your energy levels is super important. But we do have to make sure our food is still edible before we start a meal. And when I come back from each trip to the island, I always find eating my first slice of bread super exciting because I haven't had to check if it's moldy. 
By now, you're probably wondering why you haven't actually seen any of us work with the seabirds. Well, my study species return to their nests at nighttime, so all of our data collection work takes place after dark. This means we can hang out with the other island inhabitants until nightfall, which includes other birds like turbo chooks and wedge-tailed eagles, as well as the seals that live in a haul out on the other side of the island. We do take our time to relax though, which includes keeping up our fitness regimes. And there's nothing quite as relaxing as island yoga. But back to eating and dinner signifies the start of the real work. You may also have asked yourself, if Ollie's a marine ecologist, how come she's not filming in the water at all? Well, there's loads of different ways to study a seabird's behavior. And it's obviously not particularly easy to follow them into the water. So I attach small bio loggers onto the birds, which they can take to see, record their behavior and bring back to me to study. The seabirds go out to forage for fish and other yummy snacks in the daytime and return to their chicks after sunset. We only study the adults. So the lights you see here, if you squint really carefully, are us working throughout the bird colony at nighttime. My favorite part of field work is watching the shearwaters come home each night. Across half an hour, the sky becomes filled with more and more of them as they flock back in the thousands. Short-tailed shearwaters can go on foraging trips for up to three weeks at a time, and they reach all the way down to Antarctic waters. So it's epic to watch them come back from such an incredible commute. The penguins, however, have a somewhat less impressive commute. And as non-flying birds, they hop and skip over the rocky shores back to their nests. My project involves monitoring a few individual birds in particular. So we do regular checks to see if they've come home yet. And we wait at the base between those checks. Often you'll find shearwaters spending time chilling on bushes above ground. Or if you look carefully, you may find a penguin or two nestled below in a nook. Some teenager penguin chicks get quite confident and used to scientists being around. And so as we're walking through the colony, we actually have to dodge them as they run up at our feet. Other chicks have a more blunt approach for showing how they feel about their scientists in the colony. And given the thousands of birds flying above, it's not unusual to receive a gift or two from the sky. As the night goes on, our burrow checks have longer gaps between each one. So we return to the gazebo to reduce disturbance for the birds and sometimes to hide from the rain. To pass the time, we play cards, drink hot chocolate, read, or hang out with some nighttime friends that have come to say hello. These include moths, the Rakali water rat slinking around, or some insects like this praying mantis. Is she looking at me? <gasps> She's looking at fingers. Oh. It's so cute. And the occasional eight legged friend, of course. You wouldn't expect anything less from field work in Australia. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> And sometimes even my study species pops by to the gazebo for a hello. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.